Hello, everybody. Dr. F. Scott Feel here, and I wanted to give you a quick update on our main sponsor, Ice Shaker. If you're looking for a water bottle, a coffee cup, a protein shaker bottle, I have great news. Your search has ended. Ice Shaker has shaker bottles, tumblers, sports bottles, and the newest addition, and my personal favorite, the gallon and half gallon jugs. These bad boys are both massive and sturdy and keep drinks cold for hours on end. This has been my answer to making sure I drink enough water throughout my day. I've still kind of come around to the protein game and I'm new at it still, but when my doctor advised me to increase my protein intake, I turned to powdered shakes. Every other shaker bottle on the market had its issues, but Ice Shaker is the only one I tried that was vacuum sealed, had no issues with clumps or smell, and it really kept my drinks the right temperature. I love this product and I love the company and the guys behind it as they are doing amazing things and simply winning. Not only in the world of shaker bottles and sports bottles and tumblers, but in the game of life. Their partnerships and charitable donations have not gone unnoticed by the Professors of Profit Pops crew. So if you want the best beverage consumption and protein shaker solution on the market, check out the link in our show notes to grab yours today. You can even customize them with laser engraving, just like I've got here for our pteducator.com, right? And, you know, I promise you won't be disappointed with these stainless steel products. They're all colors, all sizes. You've got to check them out. Ice Shaker, let's shake things up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Professors of Profit podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Feel, and I've got with us today the amazing George Bryant. George, how the heck are you, man? Man, I'm feeling a little inferior. I always, you know, I'm going to tell you a funny story. You say doctor, and I love that, but I barely made it through high school. And so when I started as an entrepreneur and I like made it, I remember I kept making up acronyms to put after my name just because I wanted to put something there. And I just kept making up labels because I was like, I want to be like an honorary doctor somewhere. Like, what do I got to do to earn this? So I love it. I'm excited to be here, man. Well, I got to be honest with you, the ROI <laughs> on higher education and getting your doctorate these days is not quite there. So I wouldn't be jealous. <laughs> I would not worry about that at all. Uh, I will I, say I do, I do joke. I do have like a PhD in the hard knocks of life, though. There you like go. Kind of. I've kind of mastered that one. So the there education I can backfill. There you go. Well, George is on the podcast today because uh, we have actually started a business entrepreneurs and private practice student special interest group at the University of St. Augustine, where I currently teach. And this group is basically to help students learn about business, to kind of help them navigate, you know, the ins and outs of of gaining business acumen and, and what it's all about and, and mainly the business principles, um, mm -hmm. because we can't teach that in a curriculum because we just don't have the time they have to pass their board exam. So we're focusing on that so much. We don't have time to show them how healthcare business works. Right. And yep. it's, it's a messed up system right now. It really is. So they're going to have to think outside the box if they want to succeed moving forward in the world of healthcare. So George is here because his specialty is really just showing people how relationships beat algorithms. Yep. And more importantly, why business relationships are so important and why relationships are really a principle of business. So, George, I'll let you take it away, man. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts and theories on why relationships are so important in business. Yeah, man, what a what a good frame. I just kind of want to give you credit for how you even frame that, because I'm going to kind of answer this in a parallel, because I think you hit a, a few points that that have to be broken down for this to make sense. So first, like you acknowledge that being in the world of like healthcare professionals, part number one is that you're you're kind of in what I would consider a crippled industry, right? Like your hands are tied, right? So you exist in this game and in this field, right? That this game that you want to play, right? So there's a part of this where the first part of the game is accepting that if you're going to play the game, you can't complain against the rules of the field. And the faster you accept and learn how to operate within those rules, the faster you win. And the reason I say that is as an entrepreneur, the the path is very similar because as an entrepreneur, you know, there's a lot of sides of entrepreneurship that I would much rather not do or not be a part of from the theft to the stealing to the copycat accounts to ad accounts getting shut down to algorithms changing every day, right? There's there's aspects of this game that I play that I really despise. But in the in the in the overall picture, the result that I can get from playing the game is more aligned with what I want. So I'm willing to play that game, right? Just like 
if I had my dream, I would eat chocolate chip pancakes, chocolate cake, and ribeye every day and never go to the gym and have an eight pack. Unfortunately, I've yet to figure that one out. And whenever I try it, I gain 60 pounds. And so as much as I love eating like that, and I would like to not sweat and suffer every day in order for me to live long and be healthy and have the energy, I commit to my workouts. And it doesn't mean I always feel like doing them. It doesn't mean I love them. And I'm in the gym like, oh, I'm so excited to be here. But I understand that if I play that game and I use those rules, that it will get me to where I want to go. So I think state of mind is one of the most important pieces, right? So on the on the base level, and this might sound really weird, but these are some of the things that I wish I heard in the very beginning. Number one, you have to understand that nothing can be personally done to you. And a book recommendation, everything from Viktor Frankl, A Man's Search for Meaning, Anything to understand that you are you and what you do is not who you are. It's just a behavior that you took that created a result. And when you work in an industry that has rules that you don't like or where the deck seems stacked against you, which is a lot of industries and healthcare is one of them. Education is another one. Entrepreneurship is another one, right? Uh, Shipping logistics right now is another one, right? Like paid advertising is another one. There's a lot of them that are out there. You have to recognize that field and that game so that when it gets hard and when it's not ideal that you knew that that was going to come so that you have the ability to see the situation without taking it personally, without getting upset, without thinking like, oh, I failed, right? Like if I look at my track record every day with the success that I quote unquote have, I'd still say that most of my day, if I looked at it objectively enough, would be more failures than successes right? If I was taking it personally, right? But in the lens of this, it's a game. So I'm just moving pieces a lot more and finding which ones work, right? So I think the mindset is like the number one most important piece to have because I'm going to say it, it's going to be hard. And Scott will tell you as well. There are many nights where there are tears. There are many nights when there are doubts. There are weeks and weeks where you're like, why am I doing this? Those are coming. They're, They're basically inevitable. And so pretending that they're not going to come is going to set you up to fail. And it just makes it harder because if you really know in your heart that this is what you want to do, or you think it's what you want to do, you owe it to yourself to see it through the finish line, right? But only you can determine what that finish line is. That finish line might be a degree, might be a certification, might be two years in the field, might be five years in the field, right? I don't know what your expression is for you to say like, this is where I want to go. But ultimately you have to start there because you have to have that awareness so that when it gets hard and when you fail the test and when your boss undercuts you or somebody gets hired over you because of nepotism, that you can remember that they can't take anything from you, but this is what you said you wanted. So now you have to operate under these bounds and these constraints to try to create your life. And another person I would recommend in this is both of David Goggins' books. Can't Hurt Me and Never Finished, right? And I just finished both of them for the second time. And David's an incredible man. He's full of wisdom. But what I want you to hear underneath it is that even in situations where you think the deck is stacked against you and somebody has control over you, they don't. You have all the control over your behaviors, over your responses, and over your actions. So... Scott, I know that's probably really 30,000 foot view to start, but for me, that frame of thinking is the most important part because anytime I'm not there, any decision I make is going to create an undesirable result, right? And I've learned this through experience. I've been doing this since, God, I got my first job as an entrepreneur at 13, right? I'm 40, 27 years, right? And it really, really boils down to, when faced in situations when it's not ideal, right? When it's hard, when I failed, being able to find logic and clarity and act on that rather than emotion and reaction and act on that, right? So one of the things I tell to my team all the time is make sure we're never creating permanent undesirable results based on temporary feelings, right? And so in the world that you're in, which is very similar to entrepreneurship, You can invest 90 days, 180 days into a project, into a person, into a thing, and like have it be your whole identity and walk into a board or into an office and have it be shot down or somebody else take credit, right? Like that is a very real thing. It happened to me in the Marine Corps all the time. 
the reason I won in the Marine Corps is because I didn't care that they took the credit because I knew I made it. So I just went and made the next one and I made the next one. And you know what ended up happening? Somebody saw and they figured it out. And I ended up in a position four levels higher than my rank with people 10 years older than me working for me. But it meant that I had to be the example, not do the example, right? Like it was my behaviors. It was my consistency. It was those pieces. And so the mindset is the most important part because when you get it in your mind, like I want to lose a hundred pounds, when you really believe it, nothing will stop you. Nothing will stop you. The timeline might change, but if you really want it, you'll get it right. And so you kind of have to have that mindset irregardless that when you set your goal on the finish line, the finish line is non-negotiable. So therefore when you're in the race and you get a flat tire or you get a broken leg or you get run down, you might take a break you might do some triage, but eventually you're going to get back into action because you made this a non-negotiable. So that part one, the frame, the foundation is the most important part. The second part is knowing in what I do and what I teach, you will have nothing in your life, in your career, or anything in your win column that wasn't directly contributed from a relationship with another human being. And you won't think of a moment in your life now where you've ever had a win where there wasn't another human being who contributed to it. And so it's really easy in the world of business, whether you work for a company, you run your own, or you're an entrepreneur, to get lost in the transaction of business, forgetting what is underneath every ounce of business. And I'll relegate it to a simple question. And I say this to people all the time. If I ask people, I'm like, hey, have you ever spent $1,000 or more on something? And everyone's like, yeah, their hands go up, right? And I was like, cool. I was like, how many of you spent that $1,000 or more when you felt unsafe and not one hand goes up? And I'm like, oh, so you're trying to convince them of your offer, but if they don't feel safe as a human being, the offer doesn't matter, right? And so a book requirement, this is a requirement, If you want any semblance of chance to win in business based on morals, values, and principles, doing it the right way without sacrificing your soul. The book is called The Go-Giver by David Mann and Bob Berg. Bob has also been on my podcast. So if you just search The Mind of George Show, Bob Berg, you can hear me talk to the author. This book was written before I was an entrepreneur, but I didn't find it until seven years later. And this is literally, if you were to ask me, George... Give me a Bible for success. This book is my playbook and it's a three hour read for everything I do to do business. Because what you have to now understand is that relationships are the number one commodity that you can monetize. But in order to monetize them correctly, you can't be attached to getting anything out of them. That's where that book, The Go-Giver really comes in, right? But at the end of the day, Your success in any bucket, in any game, in any path is not going to come down to what you know. It's going to come down to who you know and how you know where to find what you don't know. And all of that is relegated to relationships. And so I know for a fact because of the success that I've had and all that I've lost and then what I've rebuilt and will keep forever, the secret is people. Every win, every loss, Every single thing, there was somebody there to help me navigate and make it to where I am. And the reason I say that is because now and all too often in the world that we live in, everything's relegated to transactions. Nobody even does pleasantries anymore. Like somebody will come up to me after I give a keynote at a conference and they won't be like, oh, George, that was such a great talk. They'll come up to me and they'll be like, hey, I have a question. Help me with my business. And they won't even like give me space in pleasantries because people are just so addicted presently to that instant gratification or that that current dopamine hit that they don't realize that they're sacrificing the relationship or the feelings or the relationship with that person on the other end, which is getting in the way of them actually having anything of value, right? So the way that I look at business, the way that I look at life is I think every human being I meet is my customer. That is how I see the world. And the way that I teach this is, is one of the things that I teach in business is this concept called four paths to the peer. And what I mean by that is that when I meet a human being in my life, there's only one of four things they can do. They can either meet me and leave. They can meet me and want to learn more about me. They can meet me and want to be in a relationship with me, follow me on Instagram, give me their email. They can meet me and want to buy me or hire me, right? And so I know that I help people 
with mindset, customer journey, and relationships. So for me, for every human being I meet, as long as I meet somebody and I can ask them questions and build a relationship with them and hear that they might have a mindset thing or a relationship thing and have something of value to add to them in my life, I always try to help people get a win before I ever try to do any business with them. And so one of my guiding principles for everything in my life is that you have to win before I win because by default, that's a win-win. And so even when I meet people, like after, you know, uh, I'll go to a conference or I'll go to a business conference and we're talking about doing business together, right? I might be, you know, negotiating a contract or some insurance broker deal or whatever, whatever the game is, I'll build a connection with them. But when we connect, they'll try to jump to business immediately, right? And I'll try to just listen and connect with them. And I always try to add value first, right? I try to figure out where I can make their life easier or make their life better, to build a foundation of a relationship that's not based on a transaction. And, and there's times where that leads me to realizing like, I might do that with you, Scott. And then in that realize like, oh, I don't want to do business with this man. I just want to be friends with him or the other way where I've been friends with somebody and then taken that connection call and realize that I don't want to be friends with them nor do business with them. Right. But it's, it's always this trying to find the relationship first. And so I feel like in the world that we live in, everybody goes so fast to the what am I getting or what am I giving or what's the exchange and they miss the foundation that allows that to be effective, right? And so that book, The Go-Giver, allows you to kind of think about that. And then for anybody listening to this, it doesn't matter about your career. It doesn't matter if it's your boss, if it's your coworker, if it's your supervisor, or if it's somebody in a different department in the building. How you treat them, how you show up for them and how you invest in them as people. And that doesn't mean you need to be best friends with everybody. It means that people need to feel seen, heard, respected, or loved, if not all of them, will have a direct implication on your success down the road in a way that you won't see until you're reflecting on why you didn't make it. And all those people that you didn't help or connect with were the decision makers at the points in your career. And so I say this now and I say this early, everybody matters, everybody. Everybody you talk to, every customer service rep, everybody in the office, every secretary, every boss, every customer, they all matter. And the more you focus on ensuring that you're on solid ground, irregardless of transaction or irregardless of business, the faster you're basically guaranteed to win because you end up building a pantry of unlimited resources that are there at your disposal, willing to help and almost like overjoyed to offer their help because you have a real relationship and that has to be both ways. So those are kind of my thoughts for the most long-winded answer to your question. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. And I think, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do my best Cliff's well, you said version you here. Said take it, you said take it away. So well, I, I, took, and, I took it and away. And I appreciate that. We, we appreciate that. So uh, you know, starting out at the beginning here, you know, knowing that mindset is key and you've got to play the game, right? I was yep. very much that way in that, you know, I ended up with uh, a master's degree, two doctoral degrees and $140,000 worth of student loan debt to show for it, right? Wow, and I didn't yeah. even know if I really wanted to be a PT or an educator, right? And now, you know, I'm in two fields that are struggling, right? Education, higher education and physical therapy and healthcare, right? Yeah. So that, that kind of sucks, right? Or... You can take your knowledge, your life experiences and credentials, if you have them if, or whatever, not that it matters, but and leverage them, right? Yep. yep. And leverage them to solve people's problems, right? Which, again, I, I've had opportunities that have come to me left and right out of nowhere that I never would have even imagined just because of my experience and what I do and how I help people and the relationships that I've built, Yep. you know? And I think if if we can teach the next generation of healthcare students that, hey, yeah, this debt to income ratio sucks, especially in the world of physical therapy. The average student's graduating with about $150,000 worth of student loan debt, and they're getting a job entry level at 75, 85K. Yep. That's not going to, you're not going to be able to stay above float, right? Nope, nope. However, if we look at it like, all right, these are my loans. I took them on. I'll take responsibility for them. However... I need to find a way to bridge that gap between my salary of a job that I really enjoy and what else I can do to to make up for that so that I can live, you know, comfortably and keep yep. doing the thing that I went to all these years of school for, right? Yep. Yep. So I think that becomes important for them to own it and then I, I like to gamify it, right? I say, "Okay, I've got $140,000 worth of student loan debt. How are, how are some ways I can generate revenue around my expertise and authority and specialty and really lean into that?" 
solve problems, right? Make the relationships, do the things that are going to, you know, help me uh, not now, but even down the line as yeah. investments, right? Investments in, in human capital even. And then, like you said, don't expect anything in return because we in healthcare got into healthcare. I hope most of us because we care, right? We well, for care sure. About people. Well, and there's, you um, know? I, I want to interject because there's, there's two things. Number one, um, are a lot of people are going to listen to this PTs or in the field of PT? Uh, healthcare, I would say, yep. uh, healthcare. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to use PT as an example though, for what I'm going to say, cause I've had three PTs in the last year and all of them worked in a practice. They were all my PTs, each of them for 90 days. And now within a year, all three of them own their own practices and they tripled their business. And so all they did was ask me questions every day when I was on their table for an hour. Been there, and then, done that. And then they went and, and they went and implemented it. And I was like, okay, cool. Right. And so uh, I 1000% agree with what you're saying, but what you just said about revenue, irregardless of like a medical practice, there's this thing that I teach and I'm very <laughs> hesitant about who I teach it to and how I teach it. Right. But you'll hear me joke about like, I win because I ethically poach more real estate in your life than anybody else. Right. And I don't teach what I mean by that often because it's you know, kind of giving somebody the keys to the kingdom. But what I simply mean by that is those PTs, right? All we did, right, is we looked at the, okay, they're in the clinic, right? And I was like, okay, what's standard of care for the clinic, right? There's 12 other PTs in here. You're pissed because you can't hit standard of care. You get 15 to 20 minutes of hands-on patients in a 45-minute appointment, and you don't feel like you're doing your job. I got it. Cool. That's everybody's experience. Cool. So what happens when they're in the office and what happens when they leave the office? And they mapped it out for me. And I was like, okay, so nothing happens when they leave the office, right? They're like, all right, cool. I'm like, all right, well, we win. Watch. I was like, your patient chart's going to go through the fucking roof and people are going to be begging for more time with you. And so all we started doing is we were taking the exercises that, that we were giving them. And then we were basically automating a couple emails and text messages with personal videos of them showing them the exercises on the sheet. That was it. It was three videos of like each exercise on the sheet. And then we would give them on each and then follow up. And then in between appointments, they would come back and actually have more measurable progress. So they would ask for more appointments. And then they got to a point where they're like, you can't do this anymore. So then they got offered at another clinic and like, you can take the whole hour. And then that led to the next step, right? And so I think one of the things that people don't recognize is that business isn't just when somebody is in your container, right? Like my business is not just when you're listening to my podcast. The goal is when you're listening to my podcast, to give you things and anchors and behaviors and action steps that allow you to be in a relationship with me when you're not actively listening to me or you're not in my event room or you're not actively in my course, right? So I call that ethically poaching real estate. But one of the reasons that people lose the game is they look at business only in the lens of when they're in, right? They think about the person at the grocery store only when they walk through the doors. The reason the grocery store wins is because they think about you when you're standing in your kitchen and your refrigerator is empty. And that's what gets you in because that's how their advertising is done. And so what I find is that in most service-based businesses, they don't think outside of the bucket in which they're offering the service, which does two things. Number one is it actually makes it harder for the people in your bucket to achieve the goal because you don't have any control oversight over what they're doing in between your sessions, your services, and any practice or capacity, right? And then the second part, is by not doing that, you're also decreasing your ability to build endowment, which is going to decrease the ability to hold them accountable. But when you do do it, it holds them accountable. It increases the frequency of touch points without you having to be involved. There's no codependency. It's empowered. But it also increases the top of mind awareness. They have a confirmation bias now because their reticular activating is, system is tuned into you. So therefore, if they're on the internet and they see you on Instagram, they're more likely to engage. When somebody asks them what they're doing and they're like, oh, I feel better, they're going to say, oh, why? And they're like, oh, my God, Scott, he texted me this exercise this morning and I did it and it immediately made my shoulder feel better. And that's where we actually unlock the keys to the kingdom to capitalize on what, as of 2023, 92% of marketing is word of mouth, 92%. And so understanding that one of the reasons people lose is because they only think about their customer when they're in their office. They think about what am I going to do when they walk in the door? What am I going to do when I hit today's treatment table? But the way to win is to think about not only what are they going to do when they're in there, but what have you already thought about that you're going to have them or advise them to do on their own in between that are going to hold them accountable to what you covered and make the next one even better, whether that's coaching or PT or psychology. And I have my I have two former psychologists of mine that have now become my clients. We role swapped. 
and I started coaching them in their business. I'm like, hey, it would help me if you did this for me between appointments, right? And they would start texting me my notes or my takeaways. And then I got better. And then we started making it a part of the practice. And so then, you know, you just have to be willing to think about the entire holistic experience of the customer, even before they pay you money, because nobody ever says, like my favorite example of this one is Nike's billboard doesn't say, just do it only if you wear my running shoes or just do it only if you buy my joggers, right? It says, just do it. It's for everybody. And we have to understand that business isn't business only if somebody pays us. Everybody is our customer. And our job isn't to find our ideal customer, it's to create them. But just because somebody's not paying you doesn't mean they're not your customer. You're just monetizing the relationship differently. And so by thinking about this, it allows you this ability to kind of holistically think about the whole experience and where you can impact people in their life and hold them accountable, which helps both them and you achieve that goal that you want to achieve. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like you talk about, you know, with the customer journey, you have to yep. know what that looks like from start to finish, you know, because like you said, yeah, when they're on the treatment table, that's, that's skills. Like that's kind of technician yep. stuff. You've yep. got to be thinking more at that, that communicator level where you can like get them inspired and do their home exercises and keep them accountable. Like you said, because otherwise, you know, if I'm only seeing you three days a week for 45 minutes, like I can get some improvement, but you've got to, you've got to own up to it too and do your part. And that's one of the biggest problems is just compliance with home exercise programs when it comes to physical therapy. Well, and, and here's what everybody has to remember, right? Like you read the book contagious by Jonah Berger, right? It's, it's why things catch on, right? One of the only reasons people don't do their homework is just simply because it's not top of mind in relation to the functions and behaviors of their everyday life. Because people don't go to PT every day for 35 years. I do. I go once a week for the last 20, but I'm different, right? But it's a part of my routine. But for everybody else, it's actually a pattern interrupt to their behavior. And we expect them to come to their first appointment that they haven't been to in three years with an injury that we know is bothering them, but yet they're a mom, an entrepreneur, kids at home, a husband life. And then we give them 30 minutes a day of stretch work. And then we get upset with them two weeks later when they come back and we gaslight them that they didn't do their exercises, right? But in actuality, if we just took the time to empathize, I'm like, what could this mom do for five minutes a day? And when could she do it and have it stack it in her day? Could I ask her about a routine in the morning and be like, hey, when you're in the shower in between this, could you just hold your arm against the wall like this? And then when you get out, do this. And then when you have time, right? Like, when I give the program, the program doesn't advocate me of my responsibility. If I give you a bite of food and it's too big for you to eat and you ordered it off my menu, it's my responsibility to cut it up, right? And if I'm a personal trainer and I give you a program and you can't follow that program, that's not your responsibility. That's mine. If I give my six-year-old a set of tasks to do in the morning and he doesn't do it, I don't get to gaslight and punish my six-year-old, right? There's a reason. And if we think about it like that, it allows us the ability to really dive in and chunk down what can really move the needle and change the game. Yeah, I think, and again, coming back to that, creating a safe space, right? I, yep. I think a lot about that with my students and how I, I create a safe space for them to learn in. Yep. I try to educate and transfer knowledge. And then if they don't get it, it's on me. I've got to come yep. at it a different way and, and, yep. and say, you know, all right, that one didn't land. I got to come up with a different way that this makes sense so that you do understand it because this is important. You're going to need it eventually, you know? A thousand percent. Well, like, here's what's funny. One of my PT, and I love her to death, Sierra. I love her. Um, she knows, like, I tell her, I'm like, I am not going to do my home exercises. Like, I am so bullishly upfront about it, right? Like, and I'm like, no, I'm like, you're going to have to hold me accountable. But she also knows I'm like a monkey and I won't do shoulder stretches and I won't do bands. But if you tell me to do handstand holds against the wall, I'll do them all day. And so she just starts tricking me in and she's like, no, I know you're doing pushups, do them like this. And then, and I'm like, oh, you fucker. Right. And then my shoulder starts feeling better. She's like, oh, now will you? And I'm like, well, of course I will. Cause it's feeling better. Right. And I know she's playing a game with me, but I like playing it because like you, I like gamifying it. Right. I need to have a purpose. I need to have like a, a plan. And so I'd rather gamify it a little bit um, and make it fun. But her matching that for me is why I've followed her around to six different clinics. And now I pay her cash. Because I'm like, I want to see you. I don't care when and where. I'll double your rate. Can I pay you cash? And she's like, yep, right? And I w I'm loyal, loyal to the core, right? And then she'll, I'll, I'll leave for six weeks. And then she'll start gaslighting me at like week three. Oh, I guess you want to feel sick again, right? Oh, you don't want to be able to. And I'm like, oh, I love you do this. I'll be in tomorrow, right? It's my favorite thing. But it's, 
it's why I love it. And I yeah. think there's this level of humanity that that people are afraid to bring to business because we're taught through the existing paradigm right now that it's not there. But if you look at any business, if you really listen to what you're studying and you listen to the wisdom, like the things that we're regurgitating, we're talking about business principles that are 100 years old that existed pre-internet that foundationally required relationships to be effective. And the reason we're going through this new age right now where ads are stopping to work and social is getting more disconnected and attention spans are getting shorter is because it's the dawn of everybody screaming for connection. And what everybody has failed to recognize is that the number one USP right now, unique selling proposition, whether it's your product, your service, your offer, irregardless of if you have one, the one that you can use that will beat everybody right now is depth. And if you go one step deeper than anybody else or any competitor, you are guaranteed to win. It is one of the most effective strategies and tactics that exist right now. And I hate to say that, but it's because how dark and disconnected the world of entrepreneurship and, and, and really currently is. And so this level of understanding relationships and being willing to build them is like the number one thing that you can do to really dictate and control your success. Yeah. I think that's a a great point to kind of wrap this thing up and and kind of come away with a takeaway message here. But like, you know, if, if a, a student or a new grad or somebody in healthcare is looking to branch out and start their own business and, and really, you know, get into the world of entrepreneurship, what are some tips you would give for, you know, creating relationships and just being, you know, authentically you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so first, um, number one is you have to know who you are. And the big challenge that I had for years is it wasn't that I knew who I was, is that I failed to accept who I was without fault, blame, guilt, or shame, right? And you can't build anything. You can't build a relationship. You can't build anything that will last on hollow ground. And so the first part is having a really integrous relationship with yourself. And so I'm going to make some book recommendations, right? So um, Nicole LaPera is the holistic psychologist on Instagram, incredible psychologist, has a book called Do the Work. And then Benjamin Hardy is a behavioral psychologist who's like the number one medium writer. And he wrote a book called Personality Isn't Permanent, right? Books, relatively same premise. Get an awareness of who you are now and then awareness of who you want to be personality-wise, behavior-wise, and then do these practices to align yourself and start to build that. Nicole's book takes the feminine wound approach, and Benjamin's book takes the who do you want to be, let's change your behaviors approach, very similar approach, right? So you have to have this awareness of who you are, right? Because in order to build relationships, you have to be integrous. That doesn't mean you have to tell everybody everything about you, but you have to be honest, right? And sometimes that means hey, how's your morning? And I'm like, ah, it's not that good, but I'm happy to be here. Like, oh, you want to talk about it? I'm like, no, I'm good. I just wanted to share, right? But that's honest. Like that's really who I am in that moment. So there's a book recommendation for that called Radical Honesty, uh, which is an incredible book. And so that is the foundational part, right? Because you have to really know you. And when, when you know you, you can find what you're passionate about. And here's my rule for building relationships. I only build relationships with people if I know I can add some level of value to their life. Right. And so I, maybe it is, and I know my, my, my state of being existence and presence is a gift, but I don't think about it like that. I'm like, okay, how can I move them close to their goal? Right. So my question is when you want to start toe tapping into entrepreneurship or into anything, my question is what's the thing that excites you now that you'd be willing to help somebody do for free for the rest of your life. And if you can't answer that question, you can't start yet because your first step is trying 150 things until you find the answer to that question. Yeah. The zone of genius, I call it, or, you know, your higher calling essentially. Yes. yes. Right. And, and for me, it took 7,062 swings to get there. Right. And then now it changes periodically. Right. Like it, it's, I was like, I'll never coach people one-on-one again. I'll never be a personal development and coach again. Well, now what do I do? One-on-one coaching and personal development. Right. Like it's, it's, it's seasonal, right? But you you have to be willing to do that. And then once you have that, then you have grounds and foundation to really build a relationship with people. Because when you put yourself out there and you're in the world and you're operating and navigating, you exist knowing who you are and as something of value that you can add to the world. And you can hone that gift and hone your passion by giving it away and letting people show you the results and see what happens. And that's where you gain all the experience to know, oh, I could charge money for this, or I could help three other people with this, and I could do that. And I think what everybody has to understand is like, if you want to go from, I'm not an entrepreneur to an entrepreneur, you're going from, I've never put running shoes on to, I want to run a marathon. 
And before you can do that, you got to get familiar with your shoes and you got to get familiar with your feet and your diet and your exercise. And that requires practice. And you're going to learn where you get blisters and hot spots and what socks to wear and what shoes to tie and what outfits. And, you know, my nipples are raw, like, sorry, TMI, right? But you'll, you'll figure it out and you make those adjustments and entrepreneurs know different, right? So what you have to do is you have to get really clear on what that passion is, right? And that book, Personalities and Permanent by Benjamin Hardy, has you really think about who do you want to be in the future? Not from a place of results, but from a place of behaviors. Where do you want to be spending your time? How do you want to be thinking? And when you start to align those behaviors in your current day, it'll start to give you clarity on what you're passionate about and where you want to spend your time, right? You're passionate about helping people. That's why you have students, right? You will forever be a teacher. It is in your blood. You coach people on the weekends. You do it on airplanes. Anytime you can have a conversation with somebody, Scott, I know you are breathing life into those people. It is in your DNA and I can sense it from a mile away, right? That is naturally who you are, right? And so when you have that, it makes the game really easy because then when you have it and you know it, you can start to figure out where to express that value into the world in a way that can be monetized or help somebody else achieve their results. And so that would be my answer to that question. Yeah, a thousand percent. It's funny that you you say that because my dad was an English teacher for 30 some odd years, right? Hence the name F. Scott Feel, right? I sat in on some of his classes in high school. Those kids were dicks. I wanted no part of teaching. I was never going to mm-hmm. teach. I was like, no way. I don't know how he does it. God bless that man, right? Mm-hmm. Well, now circle around 30 years later, 40 <laughs> years later, and here I am teaching, you know, yep. uh, and it is because, yeah, I love educating. I love the light bulb moment. Yep, I love me too. transferring knowledge. And when you see them get it and it clicks, yep. you know, and again, like I teach full time physical therapy, but I also on the side have my business of coaching, right. And coaching business in healthcare. Right. So like, yep. I'm still teaching any way you look at it. I'm teaching about healthcare, education, and business. And that's it. That's my umbrella. That's my zone of genius. That's what I love to do. And here's the easiest way to hear people's zone of genius. You ever heard a woman say, we're not, I'm never getting pregnant. And what happens instantly pregnant, right? I'll never teach. I was like, I'll never be a personal development one-on-one coach, right? Like you can hear it. You can see it, right? It's, it's, it's there. And what, what really is, is understanding that when you think about, life or value, right? What we develop is we develop skills, we develop experiences and we develop tools and they go in our toolbox, right? And I think everybody has to understand that it's not the tools that make things valuable. It's the expression of how to use certain tools that make them valuable, right? And the reason I say that is I watch too many people get stuck in like, well, I don't have any value to bring to the world. I don't have any blank. I'd say 80% of my property that I share to the world is somebody else's. It's somebody's book. It's somebody's quote but it's my application or prescription of them that makes them effective. And so the reason I say that, Scott, is because, you know, I find a lot of people that find passions and like, well, I love talking about art. And they're like, but I don't want to help artists. And I was like, well, what do you love doing with art? And they take me through their process. And I'm like, that process would crush an entrepreneur's business. Like if they use that process to make a blank or make a blank, and they're like, oh, right. And so the more you can understand that is understanding that when you find that passion, when you find that gift, just because you have it doesn't mean the first way you express it is going to be the way that you love. But when you have the gift and the gift might be teaching or it might be speaking, you have to try every modality, open mic nights, spoken word, poetry, podcasting, videos, public speaking, keynotes, lectures. If you really want to know which one you really enjoy, But until you do, you can't say you like it or don't because that might be the path to the result that you want, but you got to be willing to try it. Yeah. A thousand percent. Well said. Well, George, thank you so much for your time, man, and for coming on. Where can people find you if they want to follow up and see what you're up to these days and hear hear you on the podcast, see you on the gram? Where can they find you? Yeah, man. I uh, This was a gift, man. I love this. I appreciate this so much. It fills my bucket. I could do this. All, well, this is what I do all day. I guess that's why I do it all day, right? I fill my bucket every day. Um, yep. No, listen, uh, you're, you're probably in one of two buckets. Uh, you, number one, either think I belong in a padded room in a straight jacket, and both of you are correct, but one of you wants to join me and the other one doesn't. If you don't, I love you. I will be here when you're ready. If you do... In order to find my slice of crazy, the best place I'd say is my podcast. It's called The Mind of George Show. Uh, everywhere where podcasts are found. And I say that because it belongs in a straight jacket. So I share the safest parts with you on the podcast. Um, you can find it at mindofgeorge.com. And if you want to see the pinkest male website that you will ever see, go to mindofgeorge.com. We are proud of our pink. And um, 
the podcast is there. Our customer journey is there. We got some mindset stuff there. Everything's for free. We just want to help you if we can in any way. And of course, if you have any questions, you want to connect with me personally, you can send us a DM on Instagram. It's really easy. It's linked on the website at mindofgeorge.com or our Instagram is it's George Bryant and the it's is included. So it's I-T-S-G-E-O-R-G-E-B-R-Y-A-N-T because some 76-year-old realtor in Michigan has George Bryant. They won't give it to me. Well, uh, real men wear pink. They I picked do. a perfect day to wear my pink tie for you. I love it, man. Um, I saw it. I am saw it. I appreciate it. And by the way, if you ever need a, a case study, I'm like your perfect PT student from bilateral compartment syndrome to three blasted shoulders. Oh yeah. I'm a dream for you guys. Love it. I love it. Well, George, thanks so much, man. We'll put all those links in the show notes so everyone can find them easily. Thanks, George, man. always a pleasure, man. Appreciate thanks, you. my friend. Appreciate you.